In this video, we will discuss what I think is a hidden pandemic, insulin resistance. Insulin is a hormone that is central to the regulation of blood sugar levels, and insulin resistance is a condition in which the body is more or less resistant to the effects of insulin. And this does not just affect people with type 2 diabetes, but is quite common in the non-diabetic portion of the population as well. At the end of this video, you will understand why you may want to know whether you are insulin resistant, and you will be able to have a discussion with your doctor about the type of test you want to have done to measure insulin resistance. I will also share how to correctly interpret these lab results so that you can draw the correct conclusions from the test. Welcome to Nourished by Science. My name is Mario, and on this channel I share evidence-based information about nutrition as it relates to the prevention of chronic disease. In the three most recent videos, we talked about blood sugar spikes, and I shared several strategies on how you can avoid them. Several of you commented that blood sugar is not the only biomarker we should be looking at when we eat carbs. Because even if we avoid a blood sugar spike, we may still experience an insulin spike and not even know about it. That is correct, because we cannot necessarily know from our blood sugar levels what our blood insulin levels look like. Even if we don't have diabetes, if we are insulin resistant, we may constantly have very high insulin levels in our blood. And as we will see in this new series on insulin resistance, we are starting with this video here. Being insulin resistant and having high insulin levels in the blood is not ideal. My goal with this video here is to share my thoughts on why it is important to know whether we are insulin resistant, explain which lab test makes the most sense if we want to measure insulin resistance, and provide guidance on how to interpret the lab results. Let's first review the relationship between blood glucose and blood insulin levels. This was covered in detail in my video on the regulation of blood sugar. In that video, we talked about two men, Ben and Jack. Both undergo an oral glucose tolerance test, during which they drink a beverage containing 75 grams of glucose. Both are healthy with good glucose tolerance, and they have almost identical blood sugar responses. So from these two curves, you would think that all is well and neither of them has any issues with their blood sugar regulation. This is an incorrect assumption, however, and that becomes clear when we look at the blood insulin levels. Jack has very low insulin levels in the fasting state and barely a bump during the test. He is very insulin sensitive and his body requires very little insulin to keep his blood sugar in the normal range. Ben, by contrast, is very insulin resistant. That's already apparent in the fasting state with much higher fasting insulin levels. But then upon drinking the 75 gram glucose beverage, his insulin levels shoot up like a rocket. Because his tissues are resistant to the effects of insulin, he needs much higher concentrations of insulin to clear the sugar from the blood after a meal. Or let's look at someone else, Linda here. She has obesity, but according to her doctor, her fasting glucose and HbA1c levels are fine and she does not have diabetes or prediabetes. Just out of interest, she purchases a continuous glucose monitor to keep an eye on her blood sugar levels. One morning she has her typical breakfast of two slices of toast with some butter and jam. And then she watches as her blood sugar spike up to 200 mg per deciliter, stays elevated for a little bit and then drops down again. Now she's kind of worried and all ears as her hairdresser tells her about this fantastic video about blood sugar spikes on YouTube. She watches it and the next morning makes a few changes to her breakfast. She now has a lower glycemic index bread with some cheese, some pickles and a couple of boiled eggs. And lo and behold, this stuff works. Now her blood sugar level rises only to 150, 160 milligrams per deciliter, which the dude in the video says isn't a major concern and doesn't constitute a spike. Great. Well, is it great? I'd say it's better than before because all other things being equal, avoiding a blood sugar spike is a good thing. But what if we now looked at her insulin levels? We discussed in the last two videos that in some people, blood sugar spikes can be the result of a reduced first phase insulin response. However, that's not the case for Linda. She, it turns out, is insulin resistant and her body makes a lot of insulin whenever she eats carbs to handle the incoming glucose. So when she eats a high carb meal, her blood insulin levels rise a lot 
similar to what we saw earlier with Ben. And while avoiding a blood sugar spike would also reduce the requirements for insulin. See how insulin levels are lower here on day 2 compared to day 1. The blood insulin concentrations are still quite high if we compare them to someone who is insulin sensitive, like Jack in our earlier example. Now, is that even a concern? Isn't it great that her body can make this much insulin and keep her from developing diabetes? Yes, that aspect is good. Definitely better not to have diabetes. But again, all other things being equal, it would be preferable to be more insulin sensitive and not have such high insulin levels. That brings us to the next point. Insulin resistance is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. In our previous video on the regulation of blood sugar, we discussed the relationship between insulin sensitivity, shown here on the x-axis, and the amount of insulin produced by the beta cells in the pancreas, shown on the y-axis. People like Jack would be here. Jack's insulin sensitivity is high, and the amount of insulin produced by his beta cells is low. Now, a very important point. This is not to say that Jack's beta cells could not produce more insulin. They just don't have to because he's so insulin sensitive. Ben, by comparison, is very insulin resistant and as a result, his beta cells need to produce a lot more insulin. As we saw, he is still able to keep his blood sugar levels within the normal range by producing way more insulin than Jack. If we studied the relationship between insulin sensitivity and the amount of insulin produced by the pancreatic beta cell in a large group of healthy people with normal glucose tolerance, we would get a cloud like this here. Some of these people are very insulin sensitive, like Jack. Some are very insulin resistant, like Ben. And most are somewhere in the middle. What they all have in common is that their beta cells can produce enough insulin for their given level of insulin resistance. Let's plot someone with type 2 diabetes in this graph. Fred. He is as insulin resistant as Ben, but his beta cells just cannot produce enough insulin to make up for that level of insulin resistance. He therefore is unable to clear sugar from his blood and he has type 2 diabetes. So what this means is that Fred's beta cells cannot produce more insulin than this level here. And this is the key point to understand here. Everyone has a certain maximum amount of insulin they can produce. Where exactly that level is seems to depend to a large degree on genetic factors. But there is also evidence that this can change in our lifetime and that we can influence the ability of our beta cells to produce insulin, to some degree at least. So if we look at Jack again, he is perfectly glucose tolerant at this point, but if he were to become insulin resistant for some reason, we don't know whether his beta cells would be able to produce more insulin. If his maximum beta cell output were here, he would become pre-diabetic or even diabetic if he became just a little bit more insulin resistant simply because his beta cells would be unable to make any more insulin than they're currently producing. If his maximum beta cell output were up here, then he could possibly become quite insulin resistant but still have good glucose tolerance because his beta cells would be able to produce a lot more insulin. The problem is that for any given person, we typically don't know that level and I would therefore argue that all other things being equal, it's clearly preferable to be more insulin sensitive. Whatever your maximum beta cell insulin production capacity is, you're less likely to need more insulin than your beta cells can produce if you are more insulin sensitive. Let's assume that someone has a maximum beta cell capacity to produce insulin around this level here. They may not know this, but let's assume this is what it is. If they already have reduced insulin sensitivity, say they are here, then if they become just a little bit more insulin resistant, their beta cells will immediately not be able to produce more insulin and they will develop prediabetes or diabetes. However, if they start here, very insulin sensitive, they have a lot of room, so to speak. If their insulin sensitivity were to ever decline, which it may do for one reason or another, they would be able to compensate by producing more insulin and their glucose tolerance would remain normal. And this theoretical consideration is also reflected in data from cohort studies in which insulin resistance in healthy people is a risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes and a risk factor for worsening glucose tolerance in patients with type 2 diabetes. There are other reasons why it's better to be insulin sensitive and have low blood insulin levels throughout the day than being insulin resistant with high blood insulin levels. For example, higher fasting insulin concentrations 
tend to be associated with an increased risk not just of type 2 diabetes, but also cardiovascular disease and cancer. In most studies, even after adjusting for factors that are typically associated with insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, such as age, body mass index, and measures of blood sugar control, such as fasting glucose and HbA1c. And this brings us to the two key questions. Who should get tested for insulin resistance and what kind of tests should they get? Who should get tested for insulin resistance? My personal opinion is that a measurement of insulin resistance should be part of a normal metabolic blood test panel, along with fasting glucose and the serum lipid profile. Because the test is not that expensive and insulin resistance is associated with an increased risk of several chronic diseases, as we discussed earlier. Why is it then that insulin resistance is not routinely measured? One argument I can see is that the body of evidence we have so far showing that insulin resistance is an independent risk factor for chronic disease is quite a bit smaller than, say, for the serum lipid profile or blood pressure. So maybe this is just a matter of time until we have more conclusive data. Another argument I've heard is that insulin resistance is too hard to measure and that this is too expensive and not practical for routine clinical care. Indeed, the gold standard measurement of insulin resistance is very involved, but we do have reasonably good surrogate measures that correlate highly with the gold standard measurement, as we'll discuss later in this video, so I think this argument falls flat to some degree. In my opinion, there is likely another reason why insulin resistance is not routinely measured when we go for a checkup, and that is that doctors wouldn't usually do anything about insulin resistance unless the patient has manifest diabetes. In contrast to that, we have highly effective medications that can be prescribed for hypertension or high LDL cholesterol concentrations. And while we have medications that improve insulin sensitivity, they are not routinely prescribed for people who don't have diabetes. So in a way, insulin resistance is not seen as an actionable risk factor yet. I do think this will change, hopefully in the near future, because there are a lot of things we can do to reverse insulin resistance. And the available data do suggest that reversing insulin resistance may substantially reduce our risk of several chronic diseases. Now, does this mean that I suggest everyone should get insulin resistance measured every time they have their annual or biannual exam? No. There are several well-known risk factors for insulin resistance, and it would make a lot of sense to consider these when deciding in whom to measure insulin resistance and how frequently. Risk factors for insulin resistance include age, specifically being older than 45, overweight or obesity, particularly if the weight has accumulated mostly around the waist, a sedentary lifestyle, a high stress lifestyle, fasting triglycerides greater than 150 mg per deciliter, high blood pressure and chronic inflammatory conditions because inflammation triggers insulin resistance. There are also several classes of medications that cause insulin resistance. These include corticosteroids, antiretrovirals, and antipsychotics. If you take any medication regularly, it may be a good idea to discuss with your doctor whether it may induce insulin resistance. So if you're young and lean and none of these risk factors apply to you, the odds that you suffer from insulin resistance are fairly low and measuring insulin resistance is not really indicated. For anyone else though, and let's be honest, that's easily more than 50% of the adult population in most countries. It does make sense to measure insulin resistance at least occasionally. Now, that is my opinion based on my review of the evidence of the link between insulin resistance and chronic disease risk. Some researchers and healthcare professionals may disagree with this. And my position is, as far as I know, not the official recommendation of any professional medical association. So don't be upset if your doctor is resistant to measuring whether you are insulin resistant and know that he or she is probably just following the official guidelines. And that means you may need to be prepared to pay for the test yourself. So how do we measure if we are insulin resistant? What kind of test makes the most sense? The gold standard measurement of insulin sensitivity in people without diabetes is the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp, a monstrosity of a word. And if you have never heard about that, don't worry because I'm not going to talk about this. It's way too involved and it will never be done in a clinical setting. But it's relevant because the measure that I'm suggesting you could get done is fairly strongly associated with insulin sensitivity as measured, measured by this hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. And that simple measure is called HOMA-IR, 
HOMA-IR stands for Homeostasis Model Assessment of Insulin Resistance. HOMA-IR is based only on fasting glucose and fasting insulin levels. It does have its limitations, but in general, it correlates quite strongly with the gold standard measurement of insulin sensitivity based on the hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. Okay, so how do you practically go about getting HOMA-IR measured? First, the blood draw and lab measurement. The most tricky thing about getting a home IR measurement is that you need to convince your doctor to measure fasting glucose and fasting insulin concentrations in your blood. Depending on where you live, you may need to pay the bill yourself, at least for the insulin measurement. Once the doctor has agreed, you need to pay attention to a few things to make sure the test is done correctly. First, you should go to the doctor for the actual blood draw in the morning after an overnight fast of at least 12 hours and you should not have your blood drawn if you have had any illness or any indication that you have an immune activation, such as the days after vaccination, an inflammation of your joints, for example, a tooth extraction or some such thing. The reason for this is that inflammation causes insulin resistance. You should also try not to be you know, unusually stressed. So plan your doctor's office visit well and get there well in advance. Again, the stress response causes insulin resistance acutely. And lastly, be aware that if you're taking any kind of medications uh, that could affect your test. As I mentioned earlier, many medications cause insulin resistance. Again, these include corticosteroids, antiretrovirals, and antipsychotics. Let me say the most important thing again, though, before we move on. You need to get your blood drawn in the fasting state. If you had anything to eat or drink other than water in the 12 hours before the blood draw, the test is useless. Now, to the second step, and that is how to calculate HOMA IR. Here's the formula. If you get your glucose measurement back from the lab in milligrams per deciliter, the formula is insulin in microunits per milliliter times glucose in milligrams per deciliter divided by 405. If your lab reports glucose measurements in millimoles per liter, the formula is insulin in microunits per milliliter times glucose in millimoles per liter divided by 22.5. If you have trouble calculating this, you can also search online for HOMA IR calculators. These allow you to simply enter your lab values and the calculation is done for you. Now, how do we interpret our HOMA IR value? The calculation of HOMA was calibrated such that a HOMA IR of 1 is normal, healthy and perfectly insulin sensitive. But what do we call insulin resistant then? Researchers most often use HOMA IR to divvy people up into two categories insulin sensitive below a certain cutoff point and insulin resistant above that cut point. Different cutoff values have been proposed by different research teams and the one I have seen most often is 2.5 or something around 2.5, which would mean that anyone with HOMA IR of less than 2.5 would be considered insulin sensitive, whereas everyone with a HOMA IR greater than 2.5 would be considered insulin resistant. No matter which cutoff value is used, I personally don't like this approach though. I never thought it made much sense that we interpret a home IR of 2.4 totally differently than a home IR of 2.6, or that 2.6 would be interpreted the same way as a 6. I therefore would suggest we think about home IR more as a continuous measurement, or at least use it to create several different categories rather than just two. This here is how I think about this. I'd say that anyone with a home IR under 1.5 has normal insulin sensitivity, and I've never seen a publication that would disagree with this. Then between 1.5 and 2.5, that's where I'd say we have evidence of mild beginning insulin resistance. And then from there, we gradually get more insulin resistant. HOMA IR of 7, 8 or higher should be considered very insulin resistant. I suggest that the goal should be to keep HOMA IR at least under 2.5, and in my opinion, even better, under 1.5. So in a way, under 2.5 I would call fine and under 1.5 I would call excellent or optimal. There are also more sophisticated tests of insulin sensitivity and resistance other than this hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp test. You could try to convince your doctor to do an oral glucose tolerance test, have him or her draw blood in regular intervals such as every 30 minutes, and then measure not just glucose, but also insulin in these blood samples. This type of test is similar to the Kraft test, which some of you may have heard about. 
and this test would give you quite a bit more information. But there are two obstacles to this. First, you will almost never be able to find a doctor who is willing to administer this test for you, particularly if you don't have diabetes. And second, you would need someone knowledgeable to interpret the data for you. That's not so straightforward, which means that for most of you, this test would likely not be informative at all, even if you got your doctor to administer it. So for these reasons, I suggest you get a home IR test done if you're interested in whether you are insulin resistant. Now, here's a challenge for you. Over the next few months, I will publish a lot of content about insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance, and specifically evidence-based ways to improve insulin sensitivity. So what I would like to suggest is that if you get a home IR test done in the next few weeks, and it's elevated above 1.5, write the number down, and then after maybe you have learned a thing or two about how to improve insulin sensitivity and maybe made a few changes to your diet or lifestyle, measure home IR again and see how much of a difference it made. Maybe six months later, maybe 12 months later. Give it some time. I'm suggesting this because I have found that looking at concrete data can be very motivating and help reinforce new habits, particularly for something like insulin resistance, which is not something you would otherwise feel or notice. Okay, that's the end of this video. As always, you can find a more in-depth discussion and all of the relevant references in the blog post associated with this video. The link is in the description box below the video. If this was of interest to you, please leave a like below and make sure you are subscribed to the channel. And if you haven't watched the video about the regulation of blood sugar, I strongly recommend you check that out because it forms the basis for much of what we will be talking about in the upcoming videos. Again, the link to that is also in the description box below. Take care.